It is difficult for a seaman to believe that his stranded ship does not feel as unhappy at the unnatural predicament of having no water under her keel as he is himself at feeling her stranded. Stranding in, is indeed the reverse of sinking. The sea does not close upon the waterlogged hole with a sunny ripple, or maybe with the angry rush of a curling wave, erasing her name from the roll of living ships. No, it is as if an invisible hand has been stealthily uplifted from the bottom to catch hold of her keel as it glides through the water. More than any other event does stranding bring to the sailor a sense of utter and dismal failure. Failure. There are strandings and strandings, but I am safe to say that 90% of them are occasions in which a sailor, without dishonor, may well wish himself dead, and I have no doubt that of those who had the experience of their ship taking the ground, 90% did actually, for five seconds or so, wish themselves dead. Taking the ground is the professional expression for a ship that is stranded in gentle circumstances, but the feeling is more as if the ground had taken hold of her. It is for those on her deck a surprising sensation. It is as if your feet had been caught in an imponderable snare. You feel the balance of your body threatened and the steady poise of your mind is destroyed at once. This sensation lasts only a second, for even while you stagger, something seems to turn over in your head, bringing uppermost the mental exclamation full of astonishment and dismay. By Jove, she's on the ground, and that is very terrible. After all, the only mission of a seaman's calling is to keep ships keels off the ground. Thus, the moment of her stranding takes away from him every excuse for his continued existence. To keep ships afloat is his business. It is his trust. It is the effective formula at the bottom of all these vague impulses, dreams, and illusions that go to the making up of a boy's vocation. The grip of the land upon the keel of your ship even if nothing worse comes of it than the wear and tear of tackle and the loss of time remains in a seaman's memory an indelibly fixed taste of disaster. Stranded within the meaning of this paper stands for a more or less excusable mistake. A ship may be driven ashore by stress of weather. It is a catastrophe, a defeat. To be run ashore has the littleness, poignancy, and bitterness of human error. That is why your strandings are for the most part so unexpected. In fact, they are all unexpected, except those heralded by some short glimpse of the danger, full of agitation and excitement, like an awakening from a dream of incredible folly. The land suddenly at night looms up right over your bows, or perhaps the cry of broken water ahead. Is raised, and some long mistake, some complicated edifice of self delusion, overconfidence, and wrong reasoning is brought down in a fatal shock and the heart-searing experience of your ship's keel scraping and scrunching over, say, a coral reef. It is a sound for its size, far more terrific to your soul than that of a world coming violently to an end, but out of that chaos, your belief in your own prudence and sagacity reasserts itself. You ask yourself, where on earth did I get to? How on earth did I get there, with a conviction that it could not be your own act, that there has been at work some mysterious conspiracy of accident, that the charts are all wrong, 
and if the charts are not wrong, that land and sea have changed their places, that your misfortune shall forever remain inexplicable, since you have lived always with the sense of your trust, the last thing on closing your eyes, the first on opening them, as if your mind had kept firm hold of your responsibility during the hours of sleep. You contemplate mentally your mischance till little by little your mood changes. Cold doubt steals into the very marrow of your bones. You see the inexplicable fact in another light. That is the time when you ask yourself, how on earth could I have been fool enough to get there? And you are ready to renounce all belief in your good sense, in your knowledge, in your fidelity, in what you thought till then was the best in you, giving you the daily bread of life and the moral support of other men's confidence. The ship is lost or not lost. Once stranded, you have to do your best by her. She may be saved by your efforts, by your resource and fortitude, bearing up against the heavy weight of guilt and failure, and there are justifiable strandings in fogs on uncharted seas and dangerous shores through treacherous tides. But saved or not saved, there remains with her commander a distinct sense of loss, a flavor in the mouth of the real abiding danger that lurks in all the forms of human existence. It is an acquisition to that feeling a man may be better for it, but he will not be the same. Democles has seen the sword suspended by a hair over his head, and though a good man need not be made less valuable by such a knowledge, the feast shall not henceforth have the same flavor. Years ago, I was concerned as chief mate in a case of stranding which was not fatal to the ship. We went to work for ten hours on end, laying out anchors in readiness to heave off at high water. While I was still busy about the decks forward, I heard the steward at my elbow saying, The captain asks whether you mean to come in, sir, and have something to eat today. I went into the cuddy. My captain sat at the head of the table like a statue. There was a strange motionless of everything in that pretty little cabin. The swing table, which for seventy-odd days had been always on the move, if ever so little, hung quite still above the soup turin. Nothing could have altered the rich color of my commander's complexion, laid on generously by wind and sea, but between the two tufts of fair hair above his ears, his skull generally suffused with the hue of blood shone dead white, like a dome of ivory, and he looked strangely untidy. I perceived he had not shaved himself that day, and yet the wildest motion of the ship, in the most stormy latitudes we had passed through, never made him miss one single morning ever since we left the channel. The fact must be that a commander cannot possibly shave himself when his ship is aground. I have commanded ships myself, but I don't know. I have never tried to shave in my life. He did not offer to help me or himself till I had coughed markedly several times. I talked to him professionally in a cheery tone and ended with the confident assertion, We shall get her off before midnight, sir. He smiled faintly without looking up and muttered as if to himself, Yes, yes, the captain put the ship ashore and we got her off. Then, raising his head, he attacked grumpily. The steward, a lanky, anxious youth, with a long, pale face and two big front teeth. What makes this soup so bitter? I am surprised the mate can swallow the beastly stuff. 
I'm sure the cooks ladle, ladled some salt water into it by mistake. The charge was so outrageous that the steward, for all answer, only dropped his eyelids bashfully. There was nothing the matter with the soup. I had a second helping. My heart was warm with hours of hard work at the head of a willing crew. I was elated with having handled heavy anchors, cables, boats, without the slightest hitch, pleased with having laid out scientifically bower, stream, and kedge, exactly where I believed they would do most good. On that occasion, the bitter taste of a stranding was not for my mouth. That experience came later, and it was only then that I understood the loneliness of the man in charge. It's the captain who puts the ship ashore. It's we who get her off. It seems to me that no man born and truthful to himself could declare that he ever saw the sea looking young as the earth looks young in spring, but some of us, regarding the ocean with understanding and affection, have seen it looking old, as if the immemorial ages had been stirred up from the undisturbed bottom of ooze, for it is is a gale of wind that makes the sea look old from a distance of years looking at the remembered aspects of the storms lived through it is that impression which disengages itself clearly from the great body of impressions left by many years of intimate contact if you would know the age of the earth look upon the sea and a storm the grayness of the whole immense surface the wind furrows upon the faces of the waves, the great masses of foam tossed about and waving, like matted white locks give to the sea in a gale an appearance of hoary age, lustrous, dull without gleams, as though it had been created before light itself. Looking back after much love and much trouble, the instinct of primitive man who seeks to personify the forces of nature for his affection and for his fear is awakened again in the breast of one civilized beyond that stage even in his infancy. One seems to have known gales as enemies, and even as enemies one embraces them in that affectionate regret which clings to the past. Gales have their personalities, and after all, perhaps, it is not strange for, when all is said and done, they are adverse adversaries whose wiles you must defeat, whose violence you must resist, and yet with whom you must live in the intimacies of nights and days. Here speaks the man of the masts and sails, to whom the sea is not a navigable element, but an intimate companion. The length of passages, the growing sense of solitude, the close dependence upon the very forces that friendly today without changing their nature. By the mere putting forth of their might, become dangerous tomorrow, make for that sense of fellowship which modern seamen, good men as they are, cannot hope to know. And besides, your modern ship, which is a steamship, makes her passage on other principles. Then, yielding to the weather and humoring the sea, she receives smashing blows, but she advances. It is a slogging fight and not a scientific campaign. The machinery, the steel, the fire, the steam have stopped in between the man and the sea. A modern fleet of ships does not so much make use of the sea as exploit a highway. The modern ship is not the sport of the waves. Let us say that each of her voyages is a triumphant progress, and yet it is a question whether it, it is not a more subtle and more human triumph to be the sport of the waves and yet survive achieving your end. 
in his own time, a man is always very modern, whether the seaman of three hundred years hence will have the faculty of sympathy, it is impossible to say. An incorrigible mankind hardens its heart in the progress of its own perfectibility. How will they feel on seeing the illustrations to the sea novels of our day, or of our yesterday? It is impossible to guess, but the seamen of the last generation wrought into sympathy with the caravels of ancient time by his sailing ship, their lineal descendant cannot look upon those lumbering forms navigating the naive seas of ancient woodcuts without a feeling of surprise, of affectionate derision, envy, and admiration for those things whose unmanageableness, even when represented on paper makes one gasp with a sort of amused horror were manned by men who are his direct professional ancestors no the seamen of three hundred years hence will probably be neither touched nor moved to derision affection or admiration they will glance at the photogravures of our nearly defunct sailing ships with a cold, inquisitive, and indifferent eye. Our ships of yesterday will stand to their ships as no lineal ancestors, but as mere predecessors whose course will have been run and the race extinct. Whatever craft he handles with skill, the seamen of the future shall be not our descendant, but only our successor and so much depends upon the craft which made by man is one with man that the sea shall wear for him another aspect i remember once seeing the commander officially the master by courtesy the captain of a fine iron ship of the old wool fleet shaking his hand at a very pretty brigantine she was bound the other way she was a taut, trim, neat little craft, extremely well kept, and on that serene evening, when we passed her close, she looked the embodiment of coitish comfort on the sea. It was somewhere near the Cape, the Cape being, of course, the Cape of Good Hope, the Cape of Storms of its Portuguese discoverer, and whether it is that the word storm should not be pronounced upon the sea where the storms dwell thickly or because men are shy of confessing their good hopes. It has become the nameless cape, the cape tout court, the other great cape of the world, strangely enough, is seldom if ever called a cape. We say a voyage round the horn we rounded the horn, we got a frightful battering off the horn, but rarely Cape Horn, and indeed with some reason, for Cape Horn is as much an island as a cape, the third stormy cape of the world, which is the Lewin receives generally its full name, as if to console its second-rate dignity. These are the capes that look upon the gales. The little brigantine then had doubled the cape. Perhaps she was coming from Port Elizabeth, from East London, who knows. It was many years ago, but I remember well the captain of the wool clipper nodding at her with the words, fancy having to go about the sea and a thing like that. He was a man brought up in big deep water ships and the size of the craft under his feet was a part of his conception of the sea. His own ship was certainly big as ships went then. He may have thought of the size of his cabin, or unconsciously, perhaps have conjured, conjured up a vision of a vessel so small tossing amongst the great seas. I didn't inquire, and to a young second mate, the captain of the little pretty brigantine, sitting astride a camp stool with his chin resting on his hands 
that were crossed upon the rail might have appeared a minor king amongst men. We passed her within earshot without a hail, reading each other's names with the naked eye. Some years later, the second mate, the recipient of that almost involuntary mutter, could have told his captain that a man brought up in big ships may yet take a peculiar delight in what we should both then have called a small craft. Probably the captain of the big ship would not have understood very well. His answer would have been a gruff, give me size, as I heard another man reply to a remark praising the handiness of a small vessel. It was not a love of the grand doys or the prestige attached to the command of great tonnage, for he continued with an air of disgust and contempt. Why you get flung out of your bunk, as likely as not in any sort of heavy weather. I don't know. I remember a few nights in my lifetime, and in a big ship, too, as big as they made them then, when one did not get flung out of one's bed simply because one never even attempted to get in. One had been made too weary, too hopeless to try. The expedient of turning your bedding out on a damp floor and lying on it there was no earthly good, since you could not keep your place or get a second's rest in that or any other position. But of the delight of seeing a small craft run bravely amongst the great seas, there can be no question to him whose soul does not dwell ashore. Thus I well remember a three days run got out of a little bark of 400 tons somewhere between the islands of St. Paul and Amsterdam and Cape Otway on the Australian coast. It was a hard, long gale, gray clouds and green sea, heavy weather undoubtedly, but still what a sailor would call manageable, under two lower topsails and a reefed foresail, the bark seemed to race with a long, steady sea that did not become her in the troughs. The solemn thundering combers caught her up from astern, passed her with a fierce boiling up of foam level with the bulwarks, swept on ahead with a swish and a roar, and the little vessel, dipping her jib boom into the tumbling froth, would go on running in a smooth glassy hollow, a deep valley between two ridges of the sea, hiding the horizon ahead and astern. There was such fascination in her pluck, nimbleness, the continual exhibition of unfailing seaworthiness, and the semblance of courage and endurance, that I could not give up the delight of watching her run through the three unforgettable days of that gale which my mate also delighted to extol as a famous shove. And this is one of those gales whose memory in after years returns welcome in dignified austerity. As you would remember with pleasure the noble features of a stranger with whom you crossed swords once in nightly encounter, and are never to see again. <clears throat> in this way, gales have their physiognomy. You remember them by your own feelings, and no two gales stamp themselves in the same way upon your emotions. Some cling to you in woe-begone misery. Others come back fiercely and weirdly, like ghouls bent upon sucking your strength away. Others again have a catastrophic splendor. Some are unvenerated recollections as of spiteful wildcats clawing at your agonized vitals. Others are severe like a visitation, and one or two rise up draped and mysterious with an aspect of ominous menace. In each of them, <clears throat> there is a characteristic point at which the whole feeling seems contained in one single moment. Thus, there is a certain four o'clock in the morning in the confused roar of a black and white world when, coming on deck to take charge of my watch, I received the instantaneous impression that the ship could not live for another hour in such a raging sea. 
I wonder what became of the men who silently, you couldn't hear yourself speak, must have shared that conviction with me. To be left to write about it is not perhaps the most en enviable fate, but the point is that this impression resumes in its intensity the whole recollection of days and days of desperately dangerous weather. We were then, for reasons which it is not worth while to specify, in the close neighborhood of Kerguelen, Kerguelen Land, and now when I open an atlas and look at the tiny dots on the map of the Southern Ocean, I see as if engraved upon the paper the enraged physiognomy of that gale. Another strangely recalls a silent man, and yet it was not din that was wanting. In fact, it was terrific. That one was a gale that came upon the ship swiftly, like a pampero, which last is a very sudden wind indeed. Before we knew very well what was coming, all the sails we set had burst. The furled ones were blowing, loose ropes flying, sea hissing. It hissed tremendously, wind howling, and the ship lying on her side, so that half of the crew were swimming and the other half clawing desperately at whatever came to hand. According to the side of the deck, each man had been caught on by the catastrophe either to leeward or to windward. The shouting I need not mention, it was the merest drop in an ocean of noise, and yet the character of the gale seems contained and the recollection of one small and particularly impressive sallow man without a cap and with a very still face. Captain Jones, let us call him Jones, had been caught unawares two orders he had given at the first sign of an utterly unforeseen onset. After that, the magnitude of his mistake seemed to have overwhelmed him. We were doing what was needed and feasible. The ship behaved well. Of course, it was some time before we could pause in our fierce and laborious, laborious exertions, but all through the work, the excitement, the uproar, and some dismay, we were aware of this silent little man at the break of the poop, perfectly motionless, soundless, and often hidden from us by the drift of sprays. When we officers clamored at last upon the poop, he seemed to come out of that numbed composure and shouted to us downwind, try the pumps. Afterwards, he disappeared. As to the ship, I need not say that, although she was presently swallowed up in one of the blackest nights I can remember, she did not disappear. In truth, I don't fancy that there have ever been much danger of that, but certainly the experience was noisy and particularly... Distracting, and yet it is the memory of a very quiet silence that survives. For, after all, a gale of wind, the thing of mighty sound, is inarticulate. It is a man who, in chance phrase, interprets the elemental passion of his enemy. Thus there is another gale in my memory, a thing of endless deep humming roar, moonlight, and a spoken sentence. It was off the that other cape which is always deprived of its title as the cape of good hope is robbed of its name it was off the horn for a true expression of disheveled wildness there is nothing like a gale in the bright moonlight of a high latitude the ship brought to and bowing to enormous flashing seas glistened wet from deck to trucks her one set sail stood out a coal-black shape upon the gloomy blueness of the air. I was a youngster then, and suffering from weariness, cold and imperfect oilskins which let water in at every seam. I craved human companionship, and coming off the poop, took my place by the side of the boatswain, a man whom I did not like, in a comparatively dry spot where at worst we had water only up to our knees. Above our heads, the explosive booming gust of wind passed continuously. 
justifying the sailor saying, it blows great guns, and just from that need of human companionship, being very close to the man, I said, or rather shouted, blows very hard boatswain. His answer was, aye, and if it blows only a little harder, things will begin to go. I don't mind as long as everything holds, but when things begin to go, it's bad. The note of dread in the shouting voice, the practical truth of these words, heard years ago from a man I did not like, have stamped its peculiar character on that gale. A look in the eyes of a shipmate, a low murmur in the most sheltered spot where the watch on duty are huddled together, a meaning moan from one to the other with a glance at the windward sky, a sigh of weariness, a gesture of disgust passing into the keeping of the great wind, become part of the parcel of the gale. The olive hue of hurricane clouds presents an aspect peculiarly appalling, the inky, ragged rack flying before a nor'west wind makes you dizzy with its headlong speed that depicts the rush of the invisible air. A hard sou'wester startles you with its close horizon and its low gray sky, as if the world were a dungeon wherein there is no rest for body or soul. And there are black squalls, white squalls, thunder squalls, and unexpected gusts that come without a single sign in the sky, and of each kind no one of them resembles another. There is infinite variety in the gales of wind at sea, and except for the peculiar, terrible, and mysterious moaning that may be heard sometimes passing through the roar of a hurricane, except for that unforgettable sound, as if the soul of the universe had been goaded into a mournful groan. It is, after all, the human voice that stamps the mark of human consciousness upon the character of a gale.